Well, last week we talked about forgiveness. That's a loud one. Last week we talked about forgiveness. Last week we talked about forgiveness. This week we're going to talk about something that without forgiveness is impossible. We're going to talk about living in the moment. The reason this is impossible without forgiveness is because when we looked at forgiveness last week, uh, we were reminded that bitterness is a cage. That if we're holding on to a grudge, really what we're doing is letting ourselves be stuck and alive in the past. And that's what's feeding us. That's what's holding sway over us. And so we have those past offenses, those past affronts that are always resonating and ruminating inside of us. At the same time, we're also stuck in the future. Because whenever we're holding a grudge, there's always that tension, even if it's just bubbling below the surface or behind the scenes in our minds, of what's it going to be the next time I see this person and I have this grudge against? What's going to happen the next time we're face to face? face? How's that going to go? And sometimes it goes even a little bit further than that. Um, you know, I know nobody here has ever been guilty of this. But it turns into, I'm going to get back at that person. And sometimes that takes creative forms, and sometimes that takes very uh, cruel and vindictive forms. But regardless, that bitterness and lack of forgiveness causes us to live in the past, to live in the future. But it doesn't help us to fully embrace the present. Now this sense of living in the now, living in the moment, living in the present, sometimes sounds kind of new age. Sometimes people think it sounds kind of Buddhist. But if we look at the scriptures that we just read, God has been about the present ever since the beginning of time. When he introduced himself to Moses, he didn't say, you know, I was, he said, I am. And Jesus has a very strange statement. And he says, before Abraham was born, I am. Now, that's a little bit strange to us. Because for us, time is a linear thing. We have a past, we have a present, and we have a future. It, it's not possible for all of time for us to be the present. But God's different than we are. God's eternal. God has always been. God always will be. And so everything that has ever happened through history, God has been present. And God knows. And God understands. In terms of the future, and um, <clears throat> if you know me, you, you know that I'm, I don't subscribe to the notion that God has a scripted work that we're just playing out. You know, that we each have our part to play and we're just kind of puppeted along. Um, but I do believe that God has a complete grasp and understanding of what the future is going to entail. And it's much bigger and more amazing than the script. I think God's making you know, that God knows the possible trajectories of every single one of our lives. Everything we could be, everything we could become, everything we could do, every choice we can make, God knows what it is and where it's going to lead. <coughs> this is a horrible thing to have when you're coughing. <coughs> but God knows where it's going to lead. And so God is uniquely and abundantly equipped to be exactly who God says God is. I am. At every moment, God is present. And because God has this blanket sense of knowledge, that means that God can fully be in the present and it can be trusted to give us the absolute best guidance we can possibly receive at any given moment in time. If God knows where I've been, he knows what I'm dealing with. If God knows every possible outcome of my life, God knows what is the best decision I can make right now to make that life the fullest and the most in line with God's desires for me. So this sense of I am is very key in who God is in our relationship to God. <clears throat>
So we have this sense of living in the now. God is present, and we focus on God in the present, and, uh, and we even have scripture that backs this up. How many of you familiar with this scripture? The lilies of the field do absolutely nothing, and yet Solomon in all his glory was not clothed as beautifully as that. The birds of the air, they don't plant, they don't harvest, they don't store for the winter, and yet God makes sure that every single one of them is fed. If God does this for the flowers of the field and the birds of the air, how much more do you think he will do for you? Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow's got enough to take care of itself. Worry about today. Have you ever done scripture before? So right there we can say, even Jesus said, live for now. Live in a moment. Don't worry about tomorrow. Everything's going to work out. How many of you can do that? Not many of us. In fact, most of the people that actually preach that and say, just like God, take care of it. Um, how many of them do you think have savings accounts or retirement plans? Probably all of them. Because they know that you do have to think about the future. And so this sense of living in the moment and letting go of the past, letting go of the worry of the future, it's true. But it's, there's some scripture we're going to look at here that's going to help us get a little bit of a better idea of how we can do it and do it faithfully. And I would argue that um, there's a few things that really we need to do to let go of the past and, and avoid the problems of the future. And they mostly have to do with some of the key things that scripture tells us that we should be steering away from as people of faith. Scripture encourages us to be humble, to be selfless, to be forgiving, to put God's desires before our own, to be willing to sacrifice. If we do those things, it's going to be a lot easier to live in the moment. Because here's, here's what happens if pride creeps into the picture. If pride creeps into the picture, what I start to do is maybe I start to look at the past with rose-colored glasses and I think, oh, how much better it was way back when. And I live in the glory days and I, I don't spend my time thinking about how I can make the best out of now. I spend my time wishing on what happened in the past. If I have a lot of pride in my accomplishments, I look at those accomplishments and maybe I'm tempted to just kind of ride the wave of those accomplishments and say, hey, I've done my work. I've done what I need to do and I just kind of let things go. If I'm prideful about my past, I might start to be tempted to say, look at everything I accomplished. And if I start to take all of the credit on myself, I stop listening to God in the present. Because I feel like I've already got all the answers and I can do it. And so that sense of pride causes our past to become a real big burden in terms of our relationship with God. And in terms of the future, we wind up having the same kind of a thing going on. Because if I climb to a certain elevation, and I take a great deal of pride in that, I'm looking at the future and saying, I've got to make sure nobody knocks my tower down. <coughs> or I've got to make sure that I climb to the next level so that I, I don't move backwards. And if it's fueled by pride, that becomes our focus. And so instead of asking God, what do you want me to do now? I'm thinking about what do I have to do to make sure in five years I'm where I want to be. We've talked a little bit about forgiveness and where that can kind of hem us up a little bit. And then selfishness is something similar but a little bit different. If I'm overly selfish, I'm living in the past because I look at my past and I say, you know, what, what didn't I get? What do I deserve? What did the world take from me? What should I have by right that I don't have yet? And I start to think about all that stuff, and I get trapped by it. And then instead of living in the moment and appreciating the moment, I start to look at the future more, and I say, well, this is how I'm going to get it. Then I'm going to make sure I, what I didn't get then, I'm going to get now. And it can be anything. It can be material things, it can be relational things, uh, it can be something as, um, was it Rodney Dangerfield? I don't get no respect, you know? And have you ever heard somebody say, I'm going to get my respect. You will respect me. That's future. 
That's, I want this down here, but it's not in the moment. And so, so many of these attributes that God says, you know, don't be this way. Do something different. Well, part of the reason is because those attributes prevent us from living in right now. And that's the stuff. They throw our priorities out of whack. And we stop hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit within us because it's overwhelmed by all of these other things that are around us. And all of these other voices that are in us that are related to our pride or our bitterness or our selfishness. Now, on the other side, I think there are some things in Scripture that very clearly point to the fact that the past and the future are key to hearing God's voice in the present. Because Jesus and the prophets and so many other people hear him time after time referring back to the other situations that the people of God have been through. And they remind them and say, hey, do you remember when this was going well and this was happening and this is why it was happening, this is what you need to be doing again. Or this is where people were falling away and things weren't going well. This is why it wasn't going well. Learn from it and change. And so understanding that there is a history that is, is there that we can learn from is very, very important. It's very key. And when we talk about our relationship with God specifically, we see through Scripture many, many places where we can learn these valuable lessons that will help us to be able to discern is the voice I am hearing the voice of God, the voice of the Holy Spirit, or is it something else? Is what I'm experiencing in the moment, is this desire, is this choice, is this uh, whatever, in keeping with God's will? Or is it falling into one of those same old patterns? The more familiar we are with those things, the more we can guard against them now. Jesus also says to count the cost. Jesus says, don't start something without asking yourself, can I finish it? Don't start something without asking yourself about what the result's going to be. Is the intention going to be realized? And so this sense about future is, is important in the now. Because when we're getting ready to talk about something, to think about something, to make a choice, to make a statement, to whatever, we need to ask ourselves that question, what is this really about? Is this about me or is this about God? Is this about my ambition or is this about God's call on my life? Is this about me only building up myself and my own, uh, my own kingdom? Or is this about me listening for the voice of God? And in the end, is this going to bring God's kingdom to the world? Is this going to shine my light or am I shining the light of Christ by the actions that I, that I take? Asking those questions helps us figure out in the here, in the now, what are we doing? What are we about? <clears throat> These things, this idea of living in the moment, <coughs> you know, the, the easy way is to live in the moment and then just say, go do it. That's not helpful. Because every single one of us knows that these other things are, are bumping up against us. What I'm trying to do today is just, I'm hoping to encourage each other that there is a way to use that past and present to help us move in to God's plan for right now. When will you get this moment back? Never, it just left. Right? When will you get this hour back on Sunday morning? You won't. My prayer is that when we come together, we're spending the love. We're spending time together, we're spending time with God. You ever been to a movie and said that's two and a half hours of my life I'll never get back? Again, the decisions we make in the moment have impact. Now, I want to suggest that maybe there's three things that can help us to live into the moment a little bit more fully, a little bit more faithfully. First two, very, very simple. First one, know our scripture. Know our Bible. And when I say that, I don't just mean read it, okay? You can read a story about a little blue puppy 
that uh, is, is, is fraught with bitterness and loses a friendship because of it, and then they become forgiving and they get the friendship back, and someone says, what was the story about? And you say, it was about a little blue puppy. Does that get the point of the story? No. So we can read something in this. When I say no, our, our, our story, the story of God's people, takes some time to really understand it. Take some time and, and bounce it up against other people and look at opinions that are different than your own and, and go outside and, and ask, what was going on? What's, what's this really about? What was happening back then? Why was this written the way it was? If something doesn't seem like it hit you quite right, do some digging. Ask the question of why. Figure out what's going on there. How many of you know that 70 years ago, the notion of women pastoring churches was unheard of in, in most circles? How many of you know that there's many women pastors? Do you know why the scripture was not what it has been reinterpreted? Because it wasn't just a social movement that said, oh, we want to make everybody happy, so we're going to put women in the pulpit. There's scriptural reasoning for it. You know, there was a time when women sat on one side and men sat on the other, and never the two shall meet during church. Should we start doing that again? <laughs> I just heard it, yes. <laughs> that practice was based in scripture. Clearly that practice has changed. Why? Do you know that Noah, the story of Noah, kind of disagrees with itself? The first half of the story of Noah says he took two of every kind of animal. The second half of the story of Noah says he took two of every kind of animal, except for the clean animals. Of those, he took seven pairs. Now, I've heard an explanation for that. Or someone said, well, did you ever know that if you have seven pairs, you also have one pair of that animal? No, you have seven pairs of that animal. <laughs> um, there's reasons that those things work the way that they do. And there's faithful reasons and good reasons. And in a world where people are thinking more and more critically, it may not be important for you and your own personal faith to understand those things. But boy, I tell you what, you get in a conversation with somebody one of those 85% of people who are out there that really don't buy into this whole Christian thing the way that, that we do. And they wonder. We can answer those things. And the more aware we are of that, the better we hear the voice of God, the more equipped we are in the moment to know whether or not what's coming across our minds or our hearts is in keeping with God's plans and God's path. Second one, very simple, prayer. Talking to God. And realizing it's a two-way street. Not just me asking God for what I want and waiting for it to fall out of the sky. Not just not me asking for strength and telling God all my woes and my problems or asking for forgiveness, but also actively listening for God's voice throughout the day. What is God saying to me? What is God speaking in my heart? <coughs> Bless you. Hopefully God is saying that often. But this sense of being continually plugged into God, into the Holy Spirit, and letting that Spirit guide what we do. The more intentionally, the more fully we're plugged into God through prayer and through study, the more likely it is we are going to hear God's voice far more clearly in the moment. Third one's the hardest one. Slow down. Slow down. Life has a way of pushing us in so many directions and so quickly that we don't even have time to be in the moment because we don't even have time to think. We have time to react. We're at one thing, and we're getting ready to go to the next thing. And while we're going from this thing to the next thing, we're thinking about how do I, how do I deal with everything that just happened and the thing that happened before, and how do I get to the thing I'm going to on time? Anybody relate to that? So busy, all we are, we're caught up in this race that gives us no time to breathe, no time to think, no time to reflect, let alone connect with God. And then by the time the end of the day comes, what does your brain feel like? 
Well, it feels like those old commercials where they talk about your brain on drugs and they throw it in the frying pan. That's where you're at. Involuntary going to the of coma. Slowing down is essential. Stillness is necessary. If we want to be prepared to follow God in the moment, we have got to be willing to carve things out that are just taking up space. We have got to be willing to make that place for stillness. Because oddly, when nothing is happening, usually that's when everything comes into perspective. Because when nothing is happening, we don't have the noise. We don't have all that clutter going on in our minds and our hearts and our spirits. We don't have those other things competing for the attention of God's voice and the Holy Spirit inside of us. And we can simply reflect and let clarity come. And let that connection happen. And so we slow down and we come to a place of peace. And then when we move into the rest of our day, into the rest of our week, instead of feeling like we're chasing our tail, we're ready. We're empowered. We're settled. We're equipped. That moment by moment we can be present. We can be present because we have that assurance that we know we're plugged into God. We have that assurance because we know that we have taken the time to discern what God's plan is for us. And then when things come across our path, we've already got something to, to, to butt it up against. It's not chaos. It's literally. And it works. I think... You know, when we take communion today, I want you to think about this sense of stillness. When Jesus gathered with his disciples before he was crucified, do you think that there was like bands playing in the background? Were there crowds gathered all over the place? Were people trying to rip off the roof to lower a paralyzed person in so Jesus could heal them? It was quiet. It was still. And it was in those moments, if we look further down the road in the Gospel of John, that's where Jesus was giving his disciples that parting inspiration, those parting words of, of comfort, those parting words of instruction, those parting words of encouragement, those parting words of accountability, all of these different things that undergirded the disciples in their ministry after Jesus was resurrected. They came in the stillness. I think that stillness allowed them later on to look back at the craziness they had experienced through those three years of ministry and see them with new eyes. To see it with, with new understanding. And as they saw the past clearly, they were able to live into the present. When they lived into the present, they rattled the world. Turned it upside down. And because of their work, we sit here this morning with a relationship with Jesus Christ, with redemption, and with the ability to pass it on to others. So I invite you to take a moment.
and trust that God has an answer waiting. And make that commitment to carve out that stillness in your life. Let's bow our heads together. Gracious God, we are so thankful that in every moment we are never abandoned. We thank you that your spirit is alive and well within us. We thank you that your spirit is speaking to us constantly. And Lord, we thank you that moment by moment we have the opportunity to honor you. Moment by moment we have the opportunity to start anew. Moment by moment we have the opportunity to hear your call. And so we ask that you would bless these elements to our bodies and to our spirits. Let this time be a time of communion with one another and communion with you. And help us to remember the love and the grace and a gift of your Son, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven.